Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's meetup. On today's agenda, GERT will be providing us an overview of the local government 3D scene. Just as a reminder, we'll be recording and posting this recording on meetups.com shortly after the presentation. And during the meetup, meet if you'd like to make comments or chat with other participants, then feel free to use the chat window. However, if you would like to submit a question for the team to answer, then please submit it through the Q&A window. With that said, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Gert. Thanks, Heather. Um, g'day, everyone. Um, as Heather said, um, today I would like to introduce to you the local government scene solution. And this is a collection of workflows that you can use to create and publish 3D scenes for your local government. So my name is Gert van Maren, and I work for the ESRI Software Solution Division. So let's get into it. So why did we look at developing such a solution? Well, we see more and more local governments uh, wanting to use 3D visualization in their day-to-day -day work, especially to get a better spatial understanding and to use it as a communication device and gather feedback from internal stakeholders and also the public. So what you see here, the images, those are from um, Göteborg City in Sweden. And they use 3D visualization quite extensively. Um, in this case, they're showing a new development uh, being proposed in the middle of the center of the city. And this one here is uh, of Christchurch here in New Zealand. Um, as some of you might know, five years ago there was a big earthquake and all the buildings in red are the commercial buildings that are being demolished because of the earthquake. So you can see that the skyline and the whole, the whole cityscape is going to change dramatically. And this was used with data from Sierra and the AM group to create this 3D scene. But, you know, it's not that easy to create these 3D scenes. And therefore, we wanted to create a local government solution that make this, makes this more easy. So the barrier of adoption, as we see, is that there is not a lot of 3D readily available 3D data available. So what we really wanted to create is you know, workflows that make it really easy to create 3D based scenes based on existing spatial data. And that means, first and foremost, LiDAR data. Lots of local governments have collections of LiDAR data and also lots of local governments have building footprints. So the, these two data sources, we wanted to create the local government scene solution. So this is what we created, and the initial release was in December, and we had a follow-up release in February. And as said before, it's a collection of workflows that you can use to create and publish these 3D scenes as a web scene and then share it on premise or not just online. And we did this, or we're doing this at three levels of detail. First is a basic scene, which has LOD1 buildings, basically extruded building footprints. The second one is a, what we call a schematic scene, and there we create, generate uh, basic roof forms as well. And the third level of detail is what we call a realistic scene, where we have more details on the buildings, such as, for example, textures or balconies, and also more realistic trees. And you can find this um, solution on the local government pages. If you go to solutions.rts.com and then under local government entire organization, you will find the first two components of the solution. So what we've released now is the basic scene workflow and the schematic scene workflow. Now you can download the workflow. These are ArcGIS Pro workflows. Um, you can try it directly, or you can learn more. So if we go to learn more, you get your normal overview of the requirements for these workflows, and also the components of the solution, and the, the toolboxes, and the sample LiDAR data, and the rule packages. And then we can get started. 
So first of all, you can explore the local governments. These, so what, what are they actually? You go there, you can see that at the moment, as I said, we have a basic local government scene, which is the LOD1 uh, level of detail 1 3D scene. And this scene includes uh, elevation, world topographic base map, um, LOD1 buildings, and trees. And the second scene is the schematic scene. And I said this is a level of detail 3D scene where we have buildings with roof forms. And of course, we can have directly go have a look because the end product, the end product, I should say, of this workflow is what we call a web scene. So for, for those of you that are unfamiliar with web scenes, a web scene is very similar to a web map in that it is an item on ArcGIS Online with a whole bunch of different layers. In this case, we have a, a, a couple of 3D layers streaming in from ArcGIS Server. So here we are in web scene, and I can turn, for example, shadows on to make it look a little bit better. And please note that I'm running this live. This web scene is now streaming live um, from servers in the US. But of course, as we are broadcasting this over Adobe Connect, for you guys, the performance might be a bit jerky, but I really recommend you trying it out yourself and see the kind of performance you're getting with these web scenes. So as I said, this is the uh, basic local government web scene. And we also can have a look at the schematic local government web scene. So the components here, I said before, is the um, there is an elevation layer in here we are draped with the world topographic base map. Um, now we're looking at our buildings with roof forms, and we have also, um, I think in this scene is about 300,000 um, simple traits. You can see it is slowly streaming in from uh, my portal. So how do we create these scenes, right? That's kind of the big thing. So let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation. First off, let's talk about the workflow needed to create the basic local government scene. As I mentioned before, we have four different layers uh, that we want to create for this basic scene. First of all, an elevation layer, and then we want to drape that, in this case with the world topographic base map. We want to generate LED1 buildings, and we want to generate simple trees. Now, the input to generate these so the first, the third, and the fourth layer, which is the world topographic base map we just draped on top, is um, our LiDAR data and our building footprints. Using these two sources, we're going to generate an elevation layer, an LED1 buildings layer, and our schematic trees. And then we're going to publish this basic scene that we prepare in ArcGIS Pro to our portal on-premise. And once we've done that, we can then go to our web scene viewer, and then author the scene in the web scene viewer. So if we look more directly at the actual steps, we're going to open up Pro, and I'll take you through how um, the steps are organized in Pro using ArcGIS Pro tasks. So if we go to ArcGIS Pro, as you, if you download the solution from our, um, from our website, this is a pro project that uh, you can open up. It's called the Basic Local Government C. And everything is done through tasks. So if you go to the task folder in your project window, you can see there are three tasks here that you get with the solution. So first off is publish elevation layer. We want to use a LiDAR data to generate a number of elevation surfaces. So if we open them up, you can see, I'm not going to run them now live, I just want to step you through the task so you can see what happens. So we create a last data set, which is this one here. And again, this, this sample data is provided with the solution. So what I'm doing now here is you can actually, you can actually step through it yourself. 
So you create the last data set, we're flagging outliers, so this could be birds, or points that are, we really don't want to use in our calculations. And then the task will step you through creating a digital uh, drain model. We can filter the last points first, so we can just have the points that are the ground surface, and then create the DTM. So you get a DTM created, and the same goes for a digital um, a DSM. So a DTM is the ground surface, and a DSM, digital surface model, is, is the, the, the top of the objects, right? The top of the buildings, top of the trees. So we need those two surface models to um, generate our buildings as well. And then there's a step in here to publish this digital terrain model to online or to our um, a portal. And this is kind of still a, a kind of a weird bit in the workflow is that the publishing of the terrain model is not yet possible in ArcGIS Pro. It will come with Pro 1.3. So in this case, we will have to go to desktop, to ArcMap, and uh, publish this uh, DTM as an elevation service. And the task also steps you through it, how it should be done in desktop. Right, so this is the publishing, creating and publishing of elevation layers. And then we want to create our LOD1 buildings. And of course, we have a task for this. Again, you just open up the publish LOD1 building task. And then the task will step you through how to create the building heights for the extra buildings. So basically, we feed it in the building footprints. We feed it in the DTM and the DSM that we just created. And you can set a buffer distance for around the buildings in case you have a lot of vegetation around your building footprints that we don't want to take into account with the calculation of the height. And as this runs, we just generate a number of attributes on your data that we can then use to create our buildings using um, a procedural rule. This is the CD engine rule. So let's say we've created those extra attributes, we feed it in the building footprints, we feed it in the rule package, and then we create our buildings. So as we zoom a little bit closer, we see now that we have just our extruded buildings in the scene. If I turn off the LiDAR. So this got generated automatically through the tasks. And then the last layer is our 3D trees. Again, through a task, you just hit create trees, trees, and the input for generating the tree points is the last data set. You can set the point spacing of the LiDAR. You have to set um, the vegetation class in your LiDAR. If you don't have classified LiDAR uh, with vegetation and buildings, you just set it to one or zero. Your building footprints, because we want to filter out those areas and then um, a buffer distance, and a minimum canopy height, and a maximum canopy height, and a DTM. And again, you fill all this in, and what we get in the end are a number of tree points with attributes. And again, that attribute information is derived from the LiDAR data, which we then can use to create a preset 3D trees. So we can point to the trees and use the preset functionality of Pro to generate our 3D trees. So that's basically the workflow to generate the content. And each step has a creation task and a publish task. And then we've published the layers for our basic local government web scene. Then we go to our web scene viewer on, uh, in our portal, and then we can bring in the layers, configure the layers, and create slides into team properties. So let's do that too. We go here, and we create a new scene. It will open up with a base default globe. And again, I'll take it slow so you guys don't get any jerky movements. And then I can add layers. So these are all the layers that are published. Let's say we want to show 
some of the buildings we saw earlier uh, and, and features we saw earlier. You just bring them into the web scene and then we can do to them. So here I have the points. These were the points that were shown um, as labels. And here are my buildings slowly streaming in. I won't do add any more layers, but now you can start you know, to configure your layers in here. So you have a configure layer option. You can say override my symbology. So within the web scene, you can still play with the symbology of the layers. Uh, we can enable pop-ups. So as you click on one of the buildings, you will, uh, you will get the action information stream back to you as well. And we can also create some slides. So the slides is basically a 3D bookmark. And you can say, add me this slide, and it will add here at the bottom and add another slide. And slides are a really nice way to tell a story in the web scene. And then you're done. Set the final properties like you would do with any item in ArcGIS online or portal. And you can save your web scene. That's basically the whole process of creating and publishing an LOD1 local government scene. So the requirements for a basic scene, as said before, we have we need classified LIRA, that means only ground classification with first return. We don't need building classification or any tree, vegetation classification, and we need building footprints. And the building footprints can be schema agnostic. Uh, they don't have to be in the local government information model, <coughs> data model, excuse me. Um, um, we just add attributes to them um, that in that schema. But you don't need to start out with any information model. And then what you got of it, as I said, is an LED1 level of detail 1 3D scene that is, has attribute driven extrusion. Uh, the buildings are created using CD engine rule, a procedure rule, and everything is calculated automatically. And for this basic scene, a very good use case is if you just want to get a massing of your community. What's the, the, uh, you know, the volume, if you like, of all the buildings within your community? <clears throat> and it can be used, of course, for conceptual planning. So moving on to the schematic scene. Um, this is the LOD2 scene. Um, the workflow steps here are basically the same. We're going to create the layers necessary, which is, again, an elevation layer. We're going to drape it with the topographic base map. And we're going to create LOD2 buildings, um, again, from building footprints and our LIDAR data. Before we go there, I would want to pause for for a minute and see if there's any questions about the basic scene workflow. And then I can switch over to Arceus Pro uh, project as well. Uh, so far, we don't have any questions, Gert, um, if you wanted to continue on. Yeah, sure. I'll just need to load up the uh, schematic local government scene project. Right. So now it becomes a little bit more interesting. I mean, extrusion we've been doing for a while, but we still want to include it. But um, where a, a 3D model of a community becomes really useful is when we're going to add uh, roof forms, right? Because then we can do a whole, for example, a whole lot more uh, analysis on it. And also for planning purposes, we need roof forms. So again, we um, created a bunch of tasks that will allow you to create roof forms from uh, your building footprints and your LIDAR. And there's three main steps in it. So one is the, uh, the first one is the actual extraction of the roof form. But we also include a tool that checks the quality of the output against the actual LIDAR data and gives you a, an, error, an error number for each building. So you can get a good view. You can get a good indication of the quality of the buildings generated. And then we have some manual steps in this workflow that will allow you to refine the roof forms. So let's have a look at that. Here we are in ArcGIS Pro. And of course, we have the same 
task to generate the uh, elevation layers, so we'll not show you that. But let's have a look at the, uh, the LOD2 uh, tasks. So here are my buildings, and I have a calculate building roof form script, or Python tool if you like, and we feed it with the building footprints, the DSM, the DTM, and a normalized DSM, which is basically the DTM subtracted from the DSM. And then you fill in a number of parameters. Um, these are described in the help documentation, so I won't go into them now. And then we generate a new feature class that will serve as the base for our LOD2 buildings. Then we can um, apply the city engine rule to the building footprints. And then we generate these LOD2 roof forms that you see here. And you see here, I'll, I'll move slowly, you see here the LIDAR points together with the roof forms that were generated. And you see for lots of buildings, we get a very, very good match. Um, this approach that we're using here is which we call a knowledge-based approach, knowledge-based extraction from the LIDAR, works very well on um, buildings that have um, uh, simple roof forms. That means one roof form within the building footprint. So if you have one hip or one gable roof form within the building footprint, it works, it works really well. Um, where it doesn't work well, and I can show you here as well, is when you have your building footprints, that within the building footprint, there are a whole number of other roof types. So in this case here, we might be a bit hard to see, but we have within this building, we have three different roof types within the building footprint. And then of course we pick one, because we only have one building footprint to work with. And this is a bit hard, of course, to figure out for every in each building. So what we've included is this refined building form uh, step tool. And what this does, it generates me this quality control measurement. And you can then have a map, a map next to your 3D view. Let's put them side by side. And then the color indicates the quality generated for my roof. So green and yellow are pretty good, but you see I have a whole bunch of red roofs that um, we have errors. And this is pretty obvious because here a building footprint was created for about six or eight buildings, if you like. So this method works really well if you want good output is um, if you have a building footprint for each roof type, then you get good quality output. But if you don't, then again, as said before, we have a bunch of tasks that will help you to refine your uh, buildings. So let's have a look at those. We'll go to a building that has some errors. So in this case, what you see here, it's pretty obvious. We have a roof that is a gable roof, but on the left-hand side, we have a, a more of a flat area there. And we didn't pick this up in our 3D model because we're working off the one building footprint. Now, the best way to do this, and a pretty easy one, um, is just to segment the building footprint. And we have a task for this that allows you to split the building footprint right along here. So we're creating two segments. And then we can change the rule form for the two segments, right? And here comes kind of the power of this method because we are working with procedural models. It means the buildings can be changed on the fly. So now I'm going to just modify the roof attributes. These roof attributes were automatically generated using the extraction method. But for this building, I just now want to make it a shed roof. And because it's a procedural building, you can see that the roof instantly changed. But because it created the roof with the incorrect 
uh, building height, we still need to modify that, and that's pretty simple to do as well. So the shed roof comes down, and we can also change the direction of the shed roof. So this is kind of the finer fine tuning of that um, roof form if um, the quality is not acceptable enough. And you can do the same for the other one, of course. Select that one, and you can see the eave height might not be just what we wanted. Um, so we can just change the eave height a little bit, and the building changes directly instantly. And now our building is much better looking. Now this manual workflow, of course, you wouldn't want to do for thousands and thousands of buildings. So we are going to improve this whole methodology and bring in uh, better feature extraction. So um, the manual workflow will become less and less. But we still wanted to release it now because um, I think I ran it, for example, in Christchurch, and 90% uh, of buildings were within 10% of the actual building uh, roof form height and eave height. So it was a pretty good extraction. But again, the quality is dependent on the, well, first of all, I guess, the, the lighter point density. But the second one is also the quality of your building footprints. And especially if you have lots of roof types within one footprint, we'll just pick one. And you will need to segment if you want to get all the other roof types. Okay. There's a number of other tasks in here that you can use to refine. Um, you can also, there's a task to find the vertices. What we see a lot is that building footprints are a little bit off, uh, not accurate enough when you compare it to the LiDAR. So, so the building footprints need to be adapted a little bit to the LiDAR. Right. So these are the main tasks in this workflow, right? We have an automatic extraction of roof form. Then we have a quality control task that gives you an overview of where the extraction didn't really go as planned. And then there's a number of manual steps that will allow you to refine the roof forms for those buildings. And then, of course, we have the same um, uh, tree creation and publishing workflow as well that we had in the LED one. And then we can author our web scene in the same uh, way as we did with LED1. We just go to our web scene viewer. We'll add the layers. We configure the layers and create slides and set scene properties. Now, a little bit more, because of course, you, you can imagine there is a lot of, bit, a lot of calculations going on when we do this uh, rule form extraction. So we did add uh, an extra help document on the web page that explains the actual underlying technology. So if we go to the web page here, you can see we have an entry here for the rule form extraction process. <coughs> Excuse me. And this, uh, these pages will, will explain to you how the uh, extraction is done what roof forms are supported currently. Uh, we're going to add more, more roof forms in the future. It, um, it goes through the quality control steps as well. So what is the output of the quality control? You get three uh, calculations that give you an indication of the quality of your roof forms. And um, then it uh, shows you also how to refine the buildings. So sometimes you might have an issue with the actual building height, how to solve that. Uh, you might have an issue with eave height, how to solve these. Um, there might be an issue with the actual roof form, and then you can switch through the different roof forms. So in this case here, we had it classified as a shed, but it should be a gable. We're basically you know, using the procedural technology to change the roof form here uh, by switching uh, an attribute. It also will show you a little bit, as I explained uh, before, so if you have a building footprint that has multiple roof types within the footprint, um, how to split the footprint accordingly so that the end result is a good representation of the building itself. And here's an example 
of uh, modifying the building vertices as well. Um, you can see in the top here, typically when you create your building footprints, you know, you, you wouldn't go into this courtyard here. But of course, if we want proper bit, uh, roof form, we need that as well. So you need to modify the vertices here. Now again, um, I want to stress here that these manual workflows, we do want to automate them. So we are working on improving this, these workflows. So the building footprints get automated more uh, using a tool, uh, using a GP tool rather than a manual um, intervention, if you like. And then um, what is very helpful, and I recommend going through it as well, is we, we created a video that will step you through it as well um, to this uh, refinement process. And the link is in this, uh, in this help document. Okay, so let's see if there's any questions at this stage after we've gone through the LOD2 schematic local government theme workflow. Uh, Anne had two questions. One, it seems you require portal versus online. Is that true? So what's, what kind of software is required to create these scenes? Well, um, currently it is not possible yet to publish directly 3D content to ArcGIS Online. That is being targeted for later in the year. So if you want to publish these layers to um, uh, to the web, to create a web scene, if you like, you will need to publish them to a portal. Um, as said, um, we are working on um, uh, improving this, if you like, uh, so it's, it's going to be possible to publish directly to Arcus Online, but that will be later in the year. Um, so yes, if you want to get a web scene out of your pro scene, you do need a portal at this stage. But once you have created your um, web scene on portal, you can now share it directly through ArcGIS Online as well. So the creation, the publishing needs to happen on portal, and then those layers can be shared um, through ArcGIS Online later on. A follow-up question is that she'd like to share the web scene outside of her agency. Does portal allow that? Yes, if you make if you make your layers public in Portal, then you can create the same web scene on ArcGIS online and point to those layers. So yes, this this is possible. Um, another question: You indicated that unclassified lidar will work as long as you use ground points and first return only. The, the, we need you need to have ground classification in the lidar. Yes, that is that is requ a requirement. Yes. Um, let me see. I think that is it. Okay. Okay. So then we'll just um, we'll just continue. So as mentioned before, so there's three important steps in this in this um, in this workflow. It's the actual extraction process where we extract the roof forms and we have this quality control step and then we have the refinement step. And then the end result is that, um, like I said before, we can publish this pro scene to our portal and then, uh, as, as somebody mentioned before as well, we can share this further not just online but we need, do need the portal and make our layers public in, in, in our portal. So the requirements for this schematic scene, um, as I said before, classified LIDAR, we need ground uh, classification in the LIDAR. And here also, this is very important to mention, um, we need a certain point density to create a certain quality of roof forms. You can imagine the more points you have per roof, the more accurate the actual extraction is going to be. I've tested a number of data sets, and I do recommend that you need to have a three feet or less point spacing to get a good quality output. Um, if you go with less than three feet, you can still try it, it'll still work, 
where you'll get lots more errors. So in this case, this is a good indication. If you've got three fee or less point spacing, then um, the, the, the quality of the roof, roofs that are extracted is, uh, is good, good enough. And again here, the, um, the building footprints are schema agnostic. So you do not need to have a certain schema in your building footprints to run this, this tool. Okay, so the result here, what you get out of it, again, attribute-driven roof forms. This is quite important that we're using attributes to define the roofs um, because there we can use procedural technology to generate the 3D roofs. And if you use procedural technology, which is basically the city engine technology, it means that we can easily change the roof forms in case they're not correct. So it's not one extraction and that's it. We have a building that is incorrect. No, we can still go in and manually um, edit the attributes and then automatically the building model will change. The downside of this, I guess, of course, is that it's not fully automatic, right? There is a manual cleanup, especially for complex roofs. As I mentioned, the kind of the the the, uh, the weakness of this tool, if you like, um, is that I see a lot of building footprints that people generated, let's say, especially in CBDs, that the building footprint comprises eight, eight roof forms or ten roof forms. You, you just create a building footprint for a lot of buildings. And then, yeah, we have to pick one. And this is where the better your building footprints are, the more your building footprints represent the roof types, the better the extraction will be and the less manual cleanup you'll have to do. But then again, the end result is, is it's a pretty good um, 3D model, um, which can be used for lots of use cases. So I think the LED one, the extrusion one, is kind of limited, right? Because we do need the building shape to do stuff like zoning visualization, uh, visualize zoning, uh, regulatory volumes uh, together with your building footprints to see if buildings stick through it or if you still have development potential. We can use these buildings because they got roof shapes also for shadow analysis with the shadow impact going to be for uh, for these buildings um, what's the visual impact if I put in a new building how from where can I see it and, and how much can I see of this building and another one is solar exposure if we have the proper roof forms we can calculate solar potential for all the roofs in our city and then the third thing um, i got two little fixes there because it's not being published yet. This is something I'm working on currently. Um, it's basically one step further. We want to have it looking a bit more realistic. So we'll have tasks to texturize the LOD2 buildings that we just created with the other workflow. And there'll be also a task to bring in your other 3D buildings that you already might have. Lots of local governments already have invested in 3D buildings, and this task will allow you to bring together the buildings you might generate from your LiDAR and the buildings that you might already have. And there will be an option in there to mask out. So if you want to mask out one layer with the other, probably you will want to mask out the lower level of detail with the higher level of detail. This task will help you with that as well. So you can merge together different kinds of data sets to create, it, create the best looking scene uh, from your data. And we will also have realistic looking trees in this web scene as well. And I, I can show you some work in progress. Um, let me just load this one. To give you an idea what that might look like. And then the same workflow. So we are really trying to keep it consistent. You know, again, here you'll start with building footprints and LiDAR and your or potentially your other, I call them third party LED3 buildings that you already might have invested in. And then the output, again, will be your elevation because we need to have the building sit on properly the trees and the building sit properly on the terrain. We'll have a textured LED2 buildings. We will, uh, uh, with the solution will come a what we call a geotypical texture library. That's a U.S. style library, so it will give you a typical U.S. Um, U.S. textures on the buildings. Um, but we're also planning on on uh, publishing a, a, a 
document uh, for creating these textures for your own, if you're in a different region, not in the US, how to create these textures for your own region and how to link them in with the uh, realistic scene. And then your set, your LED3 buildings and your realistic trees uh, are layers that we generate as well. And the same step, again, is we want to turn this into a web scene. So let's see if we got here. Yes, so this is the realistic scene. So in this case, up the front here, I brought in what I call my third party uh, buildings. These might have come from, a, from a, maybe even an architect, if you like. So these are high detailed models with windows in them and balconies. See, I got even balconies here on the back side. Um, I got really good looking realistic trees. And around these really good looking buildings, there are my LED2 buildings that now have been texturized with this geotypical style texture. And again, this gives you a, an extra level of detail in your scene. And this is the, what we call the realistic scene which we plan to um, publish in, uh, in, with the May release, just before the UC. OK, we can do one more question round, and then I'll wrap it up. Is there any questions at the moment? And of course, you can have questions at the end as well. Uh, there is one question. Um, a gentleman has Google Map 3D buildings for his city. Can he extract those and add them to our software? It kind of depends what the what the data format of the Google Map 3D buildings is. If it's if it's KML buildings or Collada models, yes, you can. Um, so I would need to know a little bit more about the actual format of that data before I can say whether we can add them or not. OK. Um, any other questions out there? I guess you can wrap it up. If there's any extra questions, we can just address them at the end. OK. So just to wrap it up, um, this is an ESRI-supported solution. Uh, to create and publish 3D scenes at different levels of, of detail. Um, the input, as mentioned before, is LiDAR, ground classification is necessary, and your building footprint. We generate three levels of detail, um, and the layers that we are generating is um, elevation, um, you can drape it with a base map. I didn't actually show you that, but I can I can show you that quickly if we still have a scene open here. So within the scene here, as you are uh, uh, authoring your scene, you can also switch easily to uh, world imagery, right? Or go to uh, a street base map or a topographic base map. So this is you know very easily done within the web scene viewer. And um, in the 3D buildings and the 3D trees. Now, I, I really uh, want to want to you know highlight this that the quality of the output depends on your lighter point density. Uh, the more dense your lighter points, the better the extraction will be, and also the building foot accuracy, building footprint accuracy. So there's two two key points here: is is the the building footprint actually where the building should be, and um, does the building footprint really represent the roof form that is above it as well, or is the building footprint has 10 different roof types? That will influence the quality of the extracted buildings. And again, if you you know a, a general guideline is if you got three feet or more, um, you can try generating the LED2 buildings, but probably you'll get a lot of errors. So your LED scene, LED1 scene. Extra, extra, extruded building footprint, simple trees, and elevation. This is fully automatic, and the result is a, what we call a procedural representation, which means you can still easily change your buildings by just changing attributes in the attribute table. Um, this is useful for, for massing visualization and conceptual planning. Runs reasonably fast. Um, I think I ran Naperville, which is 70,000 buildings um, that generated in 
I think under an hour on my laptop. Then the, the next level of detail up is buildings with roof form only. Um, um, what roof form only means is that details like dormers and chimneys and AC units are not being extracted, right? It is the main roof form that we're extracting. Um, it does have, it's not fully automatic. There is a manual step in there to clean up. Uh, but again, the added benefit is it's still a procedural representation. So the cleanup is, is easy because we're just changing attributes. Um, it comes with this quality control task that gives, gives you really good indication of the quality of the extracted features. And this, uh, these scenes are, are way more useful for in-depth community planning um, and, and running analysis on, on our community. And then this is to be released in May, which is the LED3 scene. Textured buildings, I, a, a task to show you how to bring in the buildings that you already might have and create realistic trees. As said before, it has this masking tool, so you can easily merge the different uh, data types coming in. And um, this scene is, uh, is, is also very useful for the planning and, and community visualization. Now, what are we planning to do um, the rest of 2016? Well, of course, we want to improve the segmentation of the roof parts. So we want to, you know, as much as possible, get rid of the manual cleanup step. So we're looking at ways to segment the roofs automatically. And also, we're looking at ways to improve the roof detail. So we do have, we're looking at other approaches that will give us the dormers on the roofs and the chimneys on the roofs, but that is still in development. Um, as said before, the realistic scene will be released in May, and also in May will be a new solution, which we call the review proposed development. If you can imagine, once you have your base scene, you would like to do something with it. And one of the main use cases that we've seen around the world is for these 3D community models is uh, for planning. So what happens if I place a proposed development somewhere in my community? Um, how is it going to affect visibility, uh, visibility from surrounding buildings, but also the proposed development itself? What can I see from this building? Can I see the river? And how much of the river can I see from the proposed development? We will bring out a solution um, that will allow you to run that analysis. Shadow analysis also. Lots of communities have shadow regulations that if you bring in a proposed development, you still need to have make sure that there's enough sunlight in public places, um, for example, parks or children's playgrounds. Um, there will be a task in there that allows you to calculate that shadow impact. As I mentioned before, solar potential as well. Um, generate the potential for each roof, uh, the, the, the the potential to, to generate power on each roof. Zoning compliance is a big one as well. We are working on, um, on tools that will allow you to generate these virtual zoning regulatory volumes, and then you can compare them with your existing buildings and see where people are violating the zoning regulations, or see where you have development potential that people basically haven't built big enough. And then the final one, which is, I think, quite an important one as well, we are working on a, a public feedback app, a 3D public feedback app. We call it the 3D public survey, that you can, which you will be able to publish this app with your base scene and your proposed development, and then ask your community a, a set of questions. Do you like this uh, proposed development from certain locations? and you will be able to gather structured feedback on that um, development. So this is all in the works, and with that, I open up another round of questions. Uh, Anne had a question. She said, I'm not sure if I miss masking. Um, can you procedurally generate a neighborhood at architecturally accurate buildings to automate the rep to automatically replace the procedural ones? Oh, sorry, maybe I, can I can I, I missed that? Can I can I read it somewhere as well? The actual ah, here we go. Um, actually, hold on. Should be able to see. 
Or uh, maybe you can say it again because I, I just I just was a bad connection there. So could you could you ask the question again? Sure. Can you procedurally generate a neighborhood? Add architecturally accurate buildings. Um, do they automatically replace the procedural ones? Um, well, the, the I think this is related to the masking functionality. So the masking just basically works on um, extent of the one building with the other. So if you let's say you got as you see here in this view here, I got a bunch of buildings, and then here I'm bringing in architecturally architectural models. It will look where the architectural models intersect with the lower level of detail models and we'll just apply a definition query on those buildings. So we're not actually deleting anything here, we're just applying a definition query based on intersection of one model with another. And then once that definition query is applied, we can just publish this layer and that, that definition query is honored. So the published layer will not have those buildings. And then I can publish my architectural models as well. And um, the final result will be this, this uh, mix of, uh, of layers, if you like. Um, there's kind of a follow-up question regarding the Google um, question before about yeah. finding out um, information about, I guess, the source of the data. Um, yeah. The source is Ketchup, uh, S K E T C H U P. Does Esri can that be brought into our software at all? Have you heard of it? S K S K P. Sketchup. Yes. Oh, Sketchup. Yes, we can bring in Sketchup models. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Sketchup models are, are are totally fine. We we do support that. Um, uh, where where I was kind of confused is that, that you, some of you might have seen these kind of Google meshes. We call them integrated meshes, which is kind of a you know a surface of the earth, which looks very nice. It's an integrated mesh, and that's a different data format. And we currently don't support it yet, but also that is in the pipeline. So um, we are looking at all the different formats, and I want to support as much as possible. Um, but I can confirm that yes, we can bring in SketchUp. Uh, models um, into our software. It's not a problem. Okay. Um, kind of jumping back into the masking. Um, yeah. So is that a definition query, a rule within the workflow? It is a task in the workflow. So a task in the workflow will allow you to uh, point to two layers and say which one should mask the other one, and then you just hit and it runs and it will mask the appropriate one. And it does that by a definition query on that layer. Uh, it looks like all the questions have been answered. Do you have any more? Feel free to submit them. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. Um, I'll just go ahead and wrap it up. It doesn't seem like there's any more questions coming in. Um, thanks for presenting, Gert. We really appreciate it, even though it's very early for you. <laughs> um, That's all right. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us for today's meetup. We look forward to seeing and hearing from you at our next meetup, which is on April 27th, where we'll be presenting an overview of blight remediation and neighborhood um, revitalization solutions. Until then, have a great afternoon, everybody.